Welcome to the Wood Journey Workshop. Today we're going to have a blast, a sand blast, literally. Stay tuned. The Wood Turning Workshop is made possible in part by Woodcraft, since 1928, providing traditional and modern woodworking tools and supplies to generations of craftsmen. Woodcraft, helping you make wood work. Easy Wood Tools, offering a full line of wood turning tools with replaceable carbide cutters. Well, we're going to be working with ash today. It's a ring porous wood, which is great for sandblasting. I'll explain a little bit more about that later. But we've got a big old chunk here. I want to cut it in half so we can get two blanks. Now, recently I was at the American Association of Wood Turners Annual Symposium, where I got to meet a wood turner who uses sandblasting to enhance his work. We've got Bill Luce with us today, and you're a fantastic artist, and you do a lot of sandblasting on your work and a lot of coloring. You're very varied, but you have some work here today. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the technique and your inspiration? Well, we have kind of a range of work here. Uh, in the last few years, I've really been focusing quite a lot on uh, Douglas fir because it, it's been a greatly unappreciated wood, but it, it presents a, uh, a fantastic texture when blasted. And I'll give you some examples here. This is a piece of Doug fir that's been turned and sanded like you normally would, and then I sandblast the surface to to raise the grain line up and, and bring the soft wood down a little and to kind of rub that up and then I can take something like a Danish oil with a pigment in it and rub it in that color sticks into the, the roughed up spot and then I simply wipe the whole piece and what I'm left is with the color down in the soft wood that I blasted away and it pops the bands. Um, That's really neat. And so it's a real simple way there. And you're a lot more advanced when you get to it's something like this, right? Right. I'm trying to figure out which way it was. And so <laughs> kind of a more extreme example. And here's another, you know, a little bit different, but you get yeah. a more extreme example. Here, I'll just bring it to the, the okay. forefront here. This is a case where the sandblasting is much more extreme. And, and this is actually a, a piece of dug fur that's been oriented cross grain and, and a log sideways. This is the natural edge of the log. This is the outside of the log. And, then, and what I do then is I blast completely through in the places that I want, exposing the grain completely, the, you know, the, the harder wood. And I leave enough of the soft wood. This is, a, this is all one piece of wood. If you see here, mm -hmm. these bands are what's left of the soft wood that I haven't blasted away. And then what I'm left with is the this kind of, a, I call them skeletal vessels from my Bones of the Tree series, and, and I'm, I'm left with this kind of a 3D presentation of the a wood grain. So it's a. That's a very advanced technique. How many hours do you think you have just in that piece? I probably have about 45 hours into that piece. Holy cow. Yeah, so. so for our viewers at home, we probably could do something a little bit simpler, but that they might be able to try, right? Right, I think something like uh, some of the more surface blasting, perhaps with some color added. Um, but just to give an example, here's a piece of cedar where I've blasted it just to raise these ridge line, and, and these kind of ridges will, will pop up in most woods. In this case, I've then made the, the whole piece black, so making it black makes this difference in the surface really stand out. That's cool. So this is a treatment that one can do with almost any wood. Some woods are a little better because that hard line is a little more defined. Well, thank you so much for sharing a little bit of your insight on this, and I hope uh, I can do you justice in the shop. Okay, great. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks a lot. Well, Bill is a wealth of information, and I picked his brain for about two hours afterwards. I got a lot of tips and techniques from him on sandblasting. I'll share those with you in a little bit. Uh, but first, we got to get to making our blank. So I've cut it out. There it is. It's about nine inches tall, about seven inches in diameter. And we'll lose a little bit of wood in the process as we do this. And if you make up more than one blank, make sure you put green wood sealer on it so you protect it and it won't split and check. Now, if you have any idea what to do with these things, please tell me because I got about a dozen of them hanging around the shop. <laughs> now, I want to take a two prong drive center because this is an uneven surface. My bandsaw skills are a little bit lagging. We're going to put that in there. And then we're going to take this over to the lathe and mount it between centers. The tools we're going to be using today are a couple of bowl gouges, a detailed spindle gouge, and a hollowing tool. And oh yeah, you're going to need a sandblasting booth. Okay, nice and tight. Nothing is hitting. 
Now this is a spindle turning because this was in the tree this way. So all the grain is running that way. Now I would use a roughing gouge, but since we're going to be turning with the bowl gouge most of the time, why don't we go ahead and use that for roughing this out. A little bit different technique. Start off slowly with our speed, bring it up. Okay. And roughing with a bowl gouge is nice and fast and easy. Okay, now we're gonna make another cut and, whoops, <laughs> there's my brain working. You know what, I've got a U-shaped bowl gouge. I really wanna use a V-shaped bowl gouge. You can see the tinier tip on there. They're the same width, but it's that shape on the tip makes this better for roughing out. So, let me show you the technique on here with the right tool. Use your thumb as a backup. Your fingers are right here. You've got the bevel aiming where you want to go. You've got the handle into your body. You put this in and you push and swing like that. You come back, do it again. And all I'm doing is roughing this out. I'm not trying to make it very smooth right now. I'm going to come back and do that in a second. But you see how the uh, pointier tip of the V-shape handles the bouncing better. The U-shape is just too wide and it'll get you grab and run you back like that. Now we'll just make a smoothing pass here. Just a little bit left. There we go. Okay, I'm just getting the width of my dovetail jaws there. Because I'm going to mount this in a chuck and I need a tenon on here. Let me turn this on, bring it down to low speed. I've got points on my calipers. So I'm going to leave this point away from the edge and this point's going to touch. And see the line it's making? There we go. Now I'll push a little bit harder. That's how far I want to go in to make my tenon. And we'll take a square nose carbide tip scraper here. Let me move the tool rest back just a bit because you need a little bit more room with this. Okay, start her up, bring the speed up a bit. Carbide tip scrapers are, they've been around for a while, but they're really catching on again in wood turning. So you just take it and you push it in straight. Nothing fancy. Come up to that line, come back. And that's as deep as the tenon I want to make. Now I'm going to go to a different tool, which is a bedan that I've ground at an angle to match the jaws inside of my chuck. So when I bring this in, I'm going to angle it in just a little bit, and I'm scraping now. I've got it down at an angle so it won't catch. And now you can see I made the perfect dovetail that'll fit my chuck. Okay, well you can see we've got the blank reverse. It's in the chuck. I've also brought the tail stock up for a little bit of support. And I am making basically the same roughing cuts that we made earlier, but I switched back to my U-shaped gouge because it gives me a little bit more control now. And with this roughed out, I can actually make the cuts like this a little bit safer because it doesn't grab as much. But all I'm doing is I'm trying to make a classical Southwest pottery shape. You know, you've seen them all your life. They're like this, just really beautiful. It's got a curve in the upper third, sweeps down. The base is a little bit narrower than the top. Just a beautiful look. Okay, I'm getting really close to the shape I want. I'm trying to make a long, gentle curve here. I don't want a straight line. So you gotta keep your body moving, leaning, do the dance. You can see I've got the tool with the bevel rubbing. And it's just a long, slow cut. Don't rush it, because it's gonna be slower and slower as you get towards the center of the wood because it's moving at fewer feet per second. 
So we're almost there. So once we get this cut done, we're done to the outside shape, we're gonna go over and do the bead on the rim. And there we go. Start I wanna go with that. Come in here a little bit like that. Clean it up. Cool. Now to start on the rim, I'm gonna to switch to a small bowl gouge. A little bit smaller profile so I can make a more delicate cut. I've lowered the tool rest and moved it to the side. And I'm just gonna come in here and clean up some of this excess wood. And hopefully, I can clean up the lens too. <laughs> now with this little bowl gouge, you can start shaping this bead. I don't have a problem with that. That's easy to do. I can very easily do the top of the bead. You see I bring it around, I'm raising the tool rest, tool handle, and I come in like that. But the problem I'm gonna run into now is when I start coming into here to finish the bead up, it's a little too tight. So in order to get in there nice and tight, I wanna to switch tools. And that's gonna take us to the detail spindle gouge. Really cool tool, really aggressive angle. So it helps us get in those corners nice and tight. This little tool is kind of like a sports car. So we're gonna just round this off a little bit more. Now, we roll it, lift the handle. You can see how it cuts in there nice and tight like that, as far as we wanna go. Come in on the side here now. Come back one more time on the side. This is almost like using a skew, and a lot less scary. There you go. Okay, well the last step before we want to hollow is to drill a hole in there, but before you do that, you want to sand the outside of your vessel to whatever grit you want to finish at, because you want this completed before you do the hollowing, and you're gonna need it sanded before the sandblasting. Now, I'm not gonna do that because I've got a surprise for you with this blank. But anyway, let's start the lathe up, and we're gonna do it at a slow speed, for drilling and we're going to drill our hole this is a one inch long bit i'm going to take it all the way to the center and the reason i'm drilling a hole is it just makes it easier for the entry cuts on hollowing for me you don't have to do it if you don't want to but it's something that i prefer to do on all my hollowing <laughs> clear the chips and keep drilling until you get to the bottom Mouth to mouth on a vessel. Breathe! Well, now we're ready to hollow. You can see I have a hollowing rig set up here, and surprise! I cut all that hard work in half because I wanna show you the pattern to how you hollow out a vessel. And this is gonna be like turning a burl, a really bad burl with lots of voids, because watch this. Air, solid, air, solid. Now the cool thing is, is you can actually see inside while I do this hollowing, which will be easier to teach you how to do it. But this is like a gigantic bad burl, and I've been asked that question several times on how do you keep the tool from falling into the voids of a burl. Well that brings us to a new segment that we're going to do on the Wood Turning Workshop. Every week I'm going to try to answer one of your questions, and we're going to call that segment, Your Turn. I got an interesting email from Bill in San Francisco. He was concerned about having his tool drop into the voids of a burl that he was turning. Well, to avoid the voids, all you have to do is adjust the speed on your lathe. Now, if your lathe is too slow, it's like skipping a rock. It's going to fall into the void. However, if the speed is too high, you'll get into a lot of trouble. <laughs> but if the speed is just right, the tool won't fall into the voids. Now I can't tell you exactly what speed to use because each piece of wood is different, but play with it and soon you'll figure out how to keep the tool from falling in. So now you know how to make speed work to your advantage. Now did I mention, don't even try this at home. Don't think about it because this is very dangerous. We're doing a huge interrupted cut here and I'm hoping we don't lose Brian, our photographer in the process, that would be bad. Now I have a hollowing rig up here. There's lots of them on the market, but the whole idea behind them is this gives you some articulation, so it's really nice. You're not hanging onto a big handle and bouncing up and down with the pressure from doing the hollowing. So all I'm doing is guiding with this and keeping pressure down here on the tool rest. Tool does all the work, I don't have to sweat it out. 
Now we're going to start this up. It's going to be a little bit rough. I've got the speed up a bit too because I've got to have it fast, like skipping that stone. I've got to have a fast speed so I don't fall into that void. So we're going to bring the tool in. I'm locking it down with my hand and I'm swinging with my right hand. See how we go? And you can actually cut on the back stroke on this too. Now I'm taking smaller than normal cuts because of that interruption there since I only have half the wood. But look how smoothly this advances. And you can see I'm working in the one range right now. And I'm working my way down to the two. And this is where drilling that hole really pays off because I don't have to work on getting the center of the wood out, which is kind of finicky sometimes. And I'm just working my way back and forth. And I'm coming up to the rim. You can see how close I'm getting to the rim. And just take a light cut and you won't have any torn out wood. So we're right in the rim area right there, right now. So I'm just smoothing the rim and coming back. And I'm coming back again. Now the tool point on this tool is right at center level. You don't want it above, you don't want it below. Now I'm kind of looking down in here to see my cut. And you smooth the tool slowly. And this is just beautiful way of hauling. I, I, there's no stress on me whatsoever. I'm just moving it back and forth. Now I've got to tell you right now I'm cheating and eating sawdust or chips. But I'm cheating because I can actually look through the wood now to see how thick I am on the wall. Well, the standard way of doing that is to stop it and take out your calipers every time and measure the wall thickness. But I got a better way of skinning this cap. <laughs> Boys and their toys, we're going to use a laser to help us out with the thickness of our walls because once you're on a solid piece, you can't see what you're doing. So I've set this up a little bit thicker than normal. That shows from the laser to the tip of the tool. Uh, if it made this wall too thin, it'd probably blow up while we're doing this demo. And again, I don't want to lose Brian, right? <laughs> okay, you're going to really like this. This is cool. If you've ever had a question about lasers, we're going to answer them right now. This is cool. <laughs> you don't normally see the laser going through it, but the red dot on top, you know, right now isn't doing me any good. So watch as I complete my cut here. Coming into the wall. You can see the laser is getting a little closer and closer to the edge. Now as it drops off, I'm right there at the thickness I want. Come back again. It's a little jumpy here again because it's an interrupted cut. But as the laser gets there, I know where I want to be. Come back and do it again. There's the thickness. No calipers, no nothing. Now a lot of people, purists will say, well that's not the way you're supposed to hollow. Well, if that was the truth, we'd all be working off a foot-powered laser right now because we wouldn't want to embrace the technology that's available to us. If you want to do it the old-fashioned way, that's fine. I have no problem with it. But I also have no problem if you want to use technology to help you out with your turnings. Now, as you keep working your way down in there, section by section, one, two, and three, you're probably not going to have a very smooth surface, and I have a pretty rough one right now. So you want to switch to a round nose scraper and smooth out one, then you work your way down to two, do two, and come on through it. So now you understand how to do the hollowing. Well, let's go have some fun and do some sandblasting. <laughs> well, we made a little trip, and we're at my friend Dennis's shop. He has an enclosed hopper style sandblaster. In other words, the media is in here, it comes through, and it cycles back so you don't waste any. Now, you can get a cheaper system where you are outside and you spray it, but you have to wear breathing protection. It's kind of nasty. Now, you want to use medium, and this is aluminum, and it's about 80 grit, I believe, but it is brown. And Bill Luce, Luce, excuse me, recommended that we actually use white aluminum. And this is 120 grit, very, very fine powder. So anyway, let's put this together and I'll show you how it works. So we take our piece, we put it inside, and we're gonna close this up, and we're gonna turn things on. Okay, I'm in rubber gloves for protection. I have my gun here and it's foot control, so there's the media coming out. 
And you can get different sizes of nozzles to do different effects, but watch the effect on the wood. See how that grain is coming out? Let me lay that down, make it a little easier. It really is a cool effect when you do this. And again, we're using 120 grip medium right now. And this is, I mentioned it earlier, this is a ring porous wood. Well, by being ring porous, every other ring is hard, soft, hard, soft. So it's easier to knock out that soft wood when you're sandblasting and get this effect. And it's like painting. If you take a lo little bit more time and stay on the piece longer, you get deeper grooves in it. You just go for the effect that you want. But this really is a great way to take a very plain piece of wood and dress it up. As you see, we're already halfway done. It doesn't take very long. And you can see all the medium flying around right now. That's why having this air circulation in here helps so you can still see what's going on. And that would be bad to breathe if you're outside doing it with the other system. Well, coming around the corner here. And we now have gone all the way around. And you can see the effect there. Now, I've got a piece of Douglas fir. This is a much softer wood. So watch what happens here. We'll be able to go all the way through this. Look at the effect you get with this. Really deep grooves. It doesn't take much time. And again, we're just using 120 grit. So if we want to be really aggressive, there you go. You can see we're starting to go all the way through now. This takes a short amount of work to do this. And we're all the way through. You see the light shining through. That is cool. Now, take a closer look. This really looks cool. You can see the shadows hitting those indentations there. And it's a beautiful look, but you don't just have to stop there. You can do a lot of things with it. We were playing around earlier and using some dyes, right? And on top of that, that's a nice red one. There's some black. It actually came out looking purple. But if you notice, there's also some white in there. Well, that's called liming wax, and it's this white stuff down here. And you can get this and just rub it onto the wood. And if you want to get in the pores, you rub heavy. If not, you know, you can stay on top, but you buff it in, and then you get a white line. It's not quite the look I'm after right now because I like this other look we were playing with, which is black shoe polish. <laughs> Except it just has a dab of liming wax on it now. But anyway, look how incredible that is. It really pops out all the grain. Really, really neat stuff. And so this is a cutoff, so that's no big loss right there. Before I get too messy, I want to show you this real quick. Our buddy Pete Black did some more Douglas fir, and you can see how easy it is to etch that out and get rid of all the soft wood in between the hard grain. And this is even more fun. He went all the way through on this cup. So this is his uh, petrified egg cup system he put together. It's kind of neat. Now, what we want to do is I'm going to use some good old-fashioned black shoe polish here, and we're going to start darkening up our piece. And if you want to, <laughs> if you want to, you can sand this down because you just sandblasted this to 120 grit. So it's a little bit rougher than what it was before because we sanded it in the shop to 220. Uh, and it will polish it up and instead of being flat, it will be shiny on the high spots and dull on the inside. You see how this just runs in there. Now, as we do this, you just want to saturate it quite a bit. And there are lots of dyes you can buy, lots of different colors. We've just shown you a couple here um, to do work like this. And I just want to put it on nice and thick. And one thing you do have to keep in mind when you're using a shoe polish of this sort, or a lot of the dyes, you do want to put a finish on top of this of lacquer. That way the dye won't rub off on your fingers or anything. You can see how that's going in there. And look how it just, it's a great contrast. It's a whole different way of making a really cool look to your work. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, little look at sandblasting. And I do want to thank Bill Luce for being on the show and sharing with us some of his work. So until the next time on the Wood Turning Workshop, keep turning.
next time on the Wood Turning Workshop. We're going to be harvesting wood, taking it back to the shop, coring it out to make bowl blanks, and I'm going to show you a really cool way then to dry the wood. And it's all going to start with this nice little sapling. You want it on top or on the ground? I think you want it on the ground. Okay. There we go. That is our first little bowl that came out. You want to maximize the airflow. You don't want any of the air to be stagnant. For more information about the Wood Turning Workshop, visit our website at rsupublictv.org. But uh, I want to... Uh, <laughs> bowl gouge. A little bit bitty. <laughs> yeah. Well, I made a little bit of trip, a little bit of trip, a little, a little bit, it's a drop into the voids in the burl. Well, half, if, 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 if. The Wood Turning Workshop is made possible in part by... Woodcraft, since 1928 providing traditional and modern woodworking tools and supplies to generations of craftsmen. Woodcraft, helping you make wood work. Easy Wood Tools, offering a full line of wood turning tools with replaceable carbide cutters. To order a DVD of this or any other episode, call 1-800-823-7210 or visit rsupublictv.org. On the Wood Turning Workshop, we're going to have a blast. We're going to use a laser to help us out with the thickness of our wall. You can see the laser is getting a little closer and closer to the edge. Now the tool point on this tool is right at center level. You don't want it above, you don't want it below. Uh, if it made this wall too thin, it'd probably blow up while we're doing this demo. And again, I don't want to lose Brian, right? <laughs>